like to welcome each of you each of you to the fifth webinar of the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association. Our topic today is Sacred Space, Preston Temple and Dunfield House. We are recording the session, so if you do not want to be seen, um, please remove your name and just switch off your video. Um, later, if you'd like to ask a question, um, then please do that through the chat function. Just message me directly and add a non or anonymous to it and then I will ask your question anonymously for you. Throughout the webinar, um, please keep yourself muted so that we can hear our wonderful speakers today. The British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association is independent of any church and seeks to involve everyone from enthusiastic scholar and church history in these aisles. Um, we welcome different perspectives and clashing views, but we insist always on civility and respect. So say what you'd like to say, but with kindness and courtesy. It is now my pleasure to hand over to, <coughs> excuse me, to Peter Trevillock, um, architect of the Preston Temple, um, sacred space for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He'll speak for about 15 minutes. Um, please put your questions and, or comments in the chat function as we go. Peter, over to you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's a delight to, to be with you this evening. Um, what am I going to talk about? Well, the Preston Temple, which is located in Lancashire in the northwest uh, England. There's a picture of it right now. Um, and first of all, as uh, architect of the temple, uh, I need to give a lot of credit to a lot of people. And um, uh, over 80 designers were involved in the building and design and of course hundreds in the contracting world not only did we design the temple there were seven buildings on the temple site but we owe everything to the, the lord and a quote from spencer w kimball former president um a past president of the church uh who said everything um is initiated by Jehovah, built by him, designed by him, dedicated to him. So, um, you know, it is uh, a team effort with um, the savior at the helm. Temples have a, a, a rich play, part to play in our church and faith. Um, since the beginning of time, there's always been a place where uh, men or women could retreat from the world and be schooled in the things of heaven. In Old Testament times, um, we have the Ark of the Covenant, and then we have the marvelous Temple of Solomon. And amongst Latter-day temples, we have the Salt Lake Temple, which was 40 years in the building. And if that was the case with the Preston Temple, we'd still be waiting another 12 years for it to finish. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was stored in the uh, uh, tabernacle. The tabernacle means portable temple. And when comparing that um, humble temple compared to modern times, but made of the most prized and costly possessions available to the wandering tribe of Israel, um, it's about the same size as the tabernacle when compared with a scale diagram of the Preston Temple. Um, but of course, after the building of the Solomon's Temple, um, after the death of Jesus Christ, the building of temples ceased. And um, it wasn't until the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was restored through a prophet Joseph Smith, then the building of temples recommenced. Uh, he said the church isn't fully organized in its proper order. It cannot be until a temple is completed. And many of you will know that the first temple in the latter day, shall we say, was in Kirtland. And its dedication was attended by glorious heavenly manifestations. Uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the church said, we expect to see the day when temples will dot the earth. Each one a house of the Lord. Now, just as a, a brief insight, when I was, uh, well, from the, real, uh, from the organization of the church in 1830, after 100 years, 
there were still only seven temples. Uh, when I was born, many years ago, there were only 10. And when I was 12, there were 13 temples. I served a mission for the church. There were 16 then. Preston Temple, when it was dedicated in 1998, that was the 52nd temple. Now there are 170 operating temples, 45 under construction and 50 announced. And so that brings a grand total of 265. When I was asked to be architect for the Preston Temple, I never believed that there would be a second temple in the UK in my lifetime. And now at this rate, there'll be probably somebody on this call that will be alive when there are a thousand temples in the world. So why me? How did I get to be involved in the, in the temple? Well, I'll keep this short, but there's a story in here that's pertinent to what happens later with the temple itself. Um, the church has no paid clergy. And in 1987, I served as the Bishop of Preston, Preston Ward in Lancashire. For those who might not know, Preston is the oldest continuously operating unit of the church anywhere in the world. Because the first missionaries came in 1837, they came straight to Preston and a branch was organized a week later and has been continuously operating ever since. And we decided we would hold a party, a celebration, 150th anniversary. The posh name, I think, is sesquicentennial. And uh, we were going to tribute the arrival of the first missionaries. And uh, we were going to visit the sites where they preached in Preston, where the first conference of the church was held on Christmas Day in 1837, with hundreds attending, and where the missionaries first lodged in Wilford Street. We had all this planned and we decided to invite members, past and present, missionaries, to this day of celebration. And somebody said to me that a young elder Gordon B. Hinckley, who later served as the president of the church, served the first part of his mission in Preston. So I wrote him a letter. Dear President Hinckley, we're holding a Preston Ward reunion. We'd love you to come. Nothing happened for weeks. I thought, well, he's very busy. And out of the blue, I received a telephone call. This is President Hinckley's secretary. He would like to speak with you, Bishop. Wow. He, oh, okay, President, how are you? He says, fine. How are you, Bishop? I was okay until you call, President. I've got your note, Peter. What's the plan? Well, in my nervous state, I could remember what the plan was. I said, we're going to tour all these sites. We're going to unveil a marker in the park commemorating the first baptisms of the church and we just love you to come he said it sounds good i'm going to come so in july 1987 he came we walked in the avonham park we walked past the river ribble the site of the first baptisms in europe and he he took me to this place which wasn't on the tourist map what on earth is this i thought this is 15 Wadham Road. Why am I telling you this? Well, he said, this is my first digs when I lived in England. Okay, fine. And he had the temerity to knock on the front door. The lady invited him in. So where did you stay? Well, I rented a room upstairs. You can go upstairs to the bedroom, but please don't get in the bed, she said. But he wanted to be a great missionary but he wasn't very successful. And from this place in the early part of his mission, he wrote back and said to his father, I'm wasting my time and your money and I should come home. And his father wrote straight back and said, Gordon, I've got your letter. I've got one thing to say, forget yourself and get to work. And that was a turning point in his life. So that's him talking to the lady as they said farewells at the end of the visit. Um, we visited the park together. This is a young me uh, overlooking the River Ribble. And we got talking, what do you do, Bishop? I'm an architect. Oh, okay, 
what kind of buildings do you do? Well, I've done this and I've done that and so forth. And he must have remembered that because just a few years later, I received a telephone call in my office from a church representative saying, Brother Trabilco, can you speak? Yes, there's going to be a second temple in the United Kingdom. Oh, thanks for telling me. That's great news. It's going to be located in Lancashire. Well, that's where I live. It's minutes from my home. Thank you for telling me. What's, why is he phoning me? And your name has been mentioned as architect. And President Hinckley has said when they determined that there was going to be a temple, I have an acquaintance, a Bishop Treblecock. Let's check him out. And well, we were checked out and we were appointed. And he came and visited uh, several times over the years. He said hi to various members of the church. And um, well, the rest is history. But there was a time when I didn't think it would happen. We went to the council and we said, we'd like to build this beautiful building in our view. And the council said, sorry, it's on the prime real estate in Chorley and it's been zoned for business use. We want employment, we don't want jobs. And uh, we scratched our heads and thought, well, maybe we need to do better. We back, went back again with more drawings and photographs. And they said, did you not listen first time? If you put an application in for the temple, we will refuse you. Wow. Well, I wrote back to President Hinckley and said, President, we're doing our best. It's difficult because there's lots of opposition. So I was kind of saying, please don't shoot me if we don't get the permission that we need. And you know, he wrote back straight away and he said, Peter, I've got your letter. We're delighted that you're involved. We have every confidence in you. And so that was my equivalent to forget yourself and get to work. And what a blessing it is. And the site um, was barren, it was meadowlands, the neighbors, and I'll tell you one story, then I'll finish. The neighbors uh, said, uh, we want this to continue as meadowland. We know the council want businesses, hotels, offices, and we formed a committee over um, and with legal advice saying, here's a pile of documents that say nothing should ever happen. And the planners said, you know, good luck. We won't support you. The neighbors won't support you. So, you know, uh, you might as well seek elsewhere. Well, in the church, we believe in having faith, doing our best. And we put our best efforts forward. And one of the things we thought was important was to go and talk to the neighbors. Well, we showed them drawings. We showed them the plan with a temple, with lily ponds around it and lots of nice landscaping, with a state center for regular meetings, with uh, what was a ditch and a bit of a pond created into a lake and uh, another um, beautiful smaller lake with a missionary training center, a temple missionary accommodation, a patron's accommodation, and a, a family history center. We put this together, we went to see the neighbors, and they asked us lots of questions. But our ecclesiastical leader for the Chorley area, what was Preston Stake in our terms, said, we've forgotten, Peter. We need to call upon the powers of heaven. The theme of tonight is sacred spaces, and this will be a sacred space for our church, for the Lord. So we should ask our members to fast and pray. So with that in mind, we went to the meeting with the neighbors. We presented drawings and then invited them to ask questions. How many Mormon pilgrims will come? Over 50,000 a year. Um, how much fundraising will have to be done? None, because when the church announces a temple, it puts aside all the monies, okay? Will there be bells ringing from the temple? No, no bells ringing. There will be an angel blowing his trumpet on the spire, but no bells. And then they ask a question that was a turning point. 
They said across the other road from us, there's some industrial buildings, wriggly tin sheds, pretty ugly looking things. What will the quality of the temple be like? And then I was prompted to ask a question. I knew that no one in the audience was a member of our faith. Good people. One of them I knew was a doctor, uh, my family doctor for many years. Good people, but no one was members of the church. But I was prompted to ask a question. I asked, has anybody in the audience ever visited a temple for the church? A solitary hand went up at the back. And then I was prompted to ask another question. Would you please tell us about your experience? Well, I didn't know what he was going to say. And he didn't say which temple he'd visited. But he said, yes, I'll be happy to share. And he stood up and he said, I visited one of your temples. The landscaping was beautiful. The workmanship was first class. And the overall uh, building was fantastic quality. And I was nodding my head and saying, thank you. And then without prompting, he pointed to his neighbors, the fellow residents that had come to the meeting with him. And he said, this will be the best neighbor that you'll ever have. And I strongly recommend that you support this proposal. Would it surprise you that nod of heads round the room, everyone was in favor. And the chief executive of this group turned around to me, said, Peter, can I ask you one more question? Certainly. What more can we do to help you with this application? And would it surprise you that every one of those neighbors signed a petition and sent it to the planners and say, we want this building. The planners told me, Peter, this is a miracle. We get petitions opposing schemes and you've got one in favor. We've never seen this before. When it went to the council for their ratification, they, um, they debated and somebody said, it's going to be called the Preston Temple, and yet it's in our town of Chorley. What do we think about that? And the leader of the council was the first to respond, and he said, it does not matter what this building is called. This will be a beautiful complex. This will be a fantastic building and a landmark for our town. And I say that we should vote for it. Would it surprise you that there was not one single vote in opposition? We got the consent and I'm gonna move on. With con and so you see, my time's up. We were able to get the consent and we were able to see the building dedicated in 1998 with Gordon B. Hinckley as the president of the church offering the dedication prayer. Now, what I'd like to do is show one more slide, which is down my list. Here we go. This is a short extract from the dedication prayer. And I'll just read it if you don't mind. This magnificent temple, this is Gordon B. Hinckley, has been reared in this beautiful area where thy chosen servants in the days of their deep poverty and great sacrifice first preached the gospel. This is 1837 he's referring to. Through 161 years of history, this land of England together with Scotland, Wales and Ireland has yielded a harvest of converts to a blessed and strengthened thy church. In the early years, thousands gave their lives. 50,000 people from Lancashire and, and parts of England emigrated within about 30 years of church history. Thousands gave their lives when they left their homes and with a hope born of an abiding faith, sailed across the seas and traversed a continent in search of Zion. Hallowed be their memory. I'll close on that. That it's been a wonderful, humbling experience to be involved with the temple. And it is a team effort. And 
divine intervention uh, was made manifest. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Sue Norton. Um, Sue with her husband Paul served for 15 years at Dunfield House on the English Welsh border in Herefordshire. Her parents before her also served in the beginning and establishment of Dunfield. Again, um, please put your questions or comments in the chat function as we go. Um, Sue, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Sacred spaces offer me the place and space to meet God. I have found sacred spaces in magnificent cathedrals and temples around the world. To the temple, that is the awe and wonder of creation. Places where we encounter God, where we can dwell in the presence of the Holy Spirit and sense the presence of the divine. Jack Adam Weber writes that a sacred space is a time and space either set aside or occurs spontaneously that offers a depth, richness and sense of meaning to us, where our sense of the sacred is more pronounced. Sacred spaces are often called a thin place where the ordinary distractions of daily life are suspended, where we connect to the God within and around us and a place where we sense something deep within us awakening. In Exodus, Moses entered a sacred space as he experienced the Holy Spirit as a burning bush. Joseph Smith Jr. experienced Christ in a grove on a beautiful spring morning. Intentionally seeking out those thin places we find ourselves in communion with the divine. Nature itself is a temple and in temples and religious buildings around the world, we see elements of nature captured in their architecture. Kirtland Temple is the beginning of the temple tradition in both Latter-day Saints and Community of Christ communities. Dedicated in 1836, Kirtland Temple was inspired by the New Testament, where Jesus said that the temple in Jerusalem was to be a place of prayer for all nations, for all peoples. In Acts 2, we read of the early Christians who worshipped regularly in the temple. The temple at Kirtland was a place of prayer, of worship and learning. Priesthood education and the school were important ministries. Kirtland has always been a place of worship, song, and presence of the Holy Spirit. Collectively, for both of our traditions, Kirtland Temple has become a place where there is a connection to spirituality, to the sacred, and to each other. The Independence Temple is dedicated to the pursuit of peace, reconciliation, and healing of the spirit and it gathers and unites us, a place of prayer and peace for all people. The prayer for peace worship focuses on a different nation each day. We hold peace conferences and international youth forums. We build Zion in our gatherings. We have soaring, challenging worship in our temple and we leave refreshed and inspired, better equipped to work for peace in our world. The temple is where we meet God and God meets us. We have 53 worldwide retreat centers situated from coastal waters to the mountain top, set in God's beautiful creation. When you step onto the grounds of these places, you sense the awe of creation and the awe of the creator. In our campgrounds, we live in community, we learn to eat, pray, study, play, laugh, sleep, and cry together. We seek out the thin spaces where God is waiting to say, welcome home. Once a family home, Dunfield now sleeps 95 people in bunk style rooms, set in 15 acres of grounds on the English Welsh border. 
We live as one with nature, where we sense the creator's presence, where the rhythm of life slows down. Set in a valley, the hills form a womb-like security. The lawns, woodlands and streams all help us put our external lives on hold as we reconnect with nature and our truest self, where we have the time and space for God. Dunfield is intentionally a group accommodation centre, which promotes the shared experience of community living. A temple is most definitely not a word that people would use to describe Dunfield. But it has become a sacred space, which becomes a temple when people gather to worship, learn and find God and God's calling for them in a deeper way. Our youth and young adult camps, our reunions and our retreats, our congregation weekends and sponsored events, the people who over the past 57 years have worked and led the way acting on their shared sacred experiences, all creating that thin space where we can find God. We worked on the premise that intentionally connecting and being in nature is to realize that we are nature, not separate from, but an integral part of nature, an integral part of the world. Our body is made up of all the same elements of minerals and energy that make up the planet. Irvin Laszlo states that our connection with an environment that is clean and positive has a positive impact on all the other layers of our existence. As those layers come into balance, we experience a greater sense of peace and connection within ourselves and with others around us. Historically, nature, mountains, rivers, trees, the sun, the moon have always been honoured in ancient traditions and cultures. It is only when we disconnect from nature that we begin polluting and destroying the environment. So let me share a few of Dunfield's sacred spaces. Our most unlikely sacred space is an old second-hand wooden army hut which now doubles as an indoor games room, rehearsal room, lecture, learning, craft space, and also as a sanctuary. This building could not be further from the architecture of the Independence Temple or the beauty and history of Kirtland Temple, but it has become a temple, a sacred space for our faith tradition. We encounter God through our sacraments that refresh and renew and challenge us to continue God, Christ's mission. We grow closer to each other and God and sometimes hear God's personal call to us to work for Zion, for peace and for a better world. Our campfire sites offer powerful connection as dead wood is transformed by fire into bright, beautiful flames that lift and warm our souls. A safe space for spontaneity, prayer, inspiration, life-changing decision-making and opportunities for personal and group transformation. Our labyrinth heals people. Many walk the labyrinth barefoot as they connect to the earth beneath their feet. A maze is designed to be confusing and leading you towards dead ends and barriers. A labyrinth helps you find your way, centering your mind as you walk to the middle, anticipating God's presence there, dwelling in peace in that space, and then walking back with Jesus with renewed sense of purpose. Sitting on the bench at Dunfield creates a sense of coming home, creating peaceful contemplation, time for chats, and being open to the spirit breathing. Our peace stone and garden with rainbow colored benches promote equality, a sense of calm, of release, 
and our freedom where all are welcome. Conversations here reach a different level of understanding, compassion and love. Dunfield is open to groups of all faiths and of none. We ask them that their only criteria to visit is to do all things in love. The hungry are fed, the lonely find friendship. Children sleep without fear. Children excluded from schools find acceptance. People with disabilities find they are celebrated for who they are, they are seen. Families learn parenting skills, the joy of reading aloud to their children. The elective mute find their voice. Young people abandoned by their family find a loving, caring home. The LGBTQI plus community find a home that is invitational, inclusive and spirit filled. Richard Raw writes, the disease facing humanity is a profound and painful sense of disconnection from God, from ourselves, from each other and the world. Sacred spaces enable us to embrace a generous love. This disconnect is only an illusion. Nothing human can stop the flow of divine love. We cannot undo the eternal pattern of love. Nothing can stop the relentless outpouring force. That is the divine dance. Compassion, grace and love overflow at Dunfield with intergeneration worships, uplifting singing, laughter chats and meeting God. People leave better equipped to be the hands and feet of Christ in our troubled world. Dunfield is a sacred space which becomes a temple when people gather to find God and to respond to God's call. At Dunfield, people live in Zion. Kirtland Temple, the Grove experience for Joseph Smith Jr., the Independence Temple, all of our campgrounds, including Dunfield, are all places where God will inspire us. However, one thing is common and clear. There is always the need to leave a collective sacred space, to return to our daily lives, to create Zion where we live. We take with us our experiences and friendships, to reach out to the bruised and brokenhearted in concrete jungles where poverty and employment, injustice and fear, hunger and overcrowding replaces the hills and streams and woodlands. We go back to create sacred spaces in our communities where those thin places are desperately needed. And we go strong in the knowledge that the same spirit will be with us. We must leave our temples and campgrounds because our call is to be a temple people wherever we live, to be a prayerful people, to be the heart and soul of Christ's mission in our own communities. Our campgrounds are both grove and temple buildings together, both sacred places where we anticipate, sense and draw closer to God. The Dunfield hymn written for its dedication in 1980 was also the first hymn sung in the Independence Temple when it was dedicated in 1994 and is now adapted to be sung wherever we gather as a faith community. For our faith, temples exist for the cause of Zion, where politics, people and economics are transformed into communities where peace, justice, reconciliation, dignity and healing are available to all people, creating sacred spaces where we live. We celebrate the temple of creation, our bodies as temples, together as the body of Christ. In meeting God in these places, we dwell in the presence of the Holy Spirit and sense the presence of the divine. In responding to those experiences, we create Zion, which is the remaking of human society. So the earth and life is one great temple of God. 
My prayer is that we can find or all find our divine dance as we continue to explore sacred spaces and our relationship with God together. As we meet all here together in a sacred space, I invite you now into a sacred pause as I close with a reading the Domfield hymn. The words are adapted slightly because I've amalgamated the two versions um, because I like the words. So, Lord, you have brought us to this place as surely as your chosen race was led to Israel's promised land where blessings flowed on every hand. Almighty God, we dare to pray that you will bless your house today. Be still and wonder at God's grace that you for us did choose this place. And here in love, you deign to share your peace and joys beyond compare. Almighty God, we praise your name, your wondrous providence acclaim. The streams and woodlands, flowers and trees, high hills and sunshine, cooling breeze. You made them all a setting true, for this your house where we meet you. Almighty God, for this place fair, accept our humble, thankful prayer. We cannot give you what is yours, so simply pray that through these doors, your light may shine, that all may view your love for us and ours for you. Almighty God, with strength endow your children for their witness now. Amen. Thank you so much to Peter and Sue for sharing with us today. Um, so now we have some time for some questions and comments. Um, please continue to put those in the chat function. Um, just a reminder, if you want to remain anonymous in your question, please just send it directly to me and just state that you'd like to be anonymous. So let's get this started. So first we had a series of kind of short questions from Carol for Peter. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of read them all off because they're kind of short, quick questions. Um, so the first question is, how long did it take to build the Preston Temple? How much did it cost? How do the neighbors feel about the temple now? And do people worship there or is it just for special sacraments? And I can repeat those if you forgot any of those. I know that was several, but. That's fine, okay, thank you. Um, um, it, we, we built it in two phases. Um, it took four years overall. Um, the first phase was to do what we call the infrastructure, to plant about 300 trees. Um, to do with the drains and the leveling and the earth moving. So we could try to achieve a semi-mature landscape on day one of the opening. And then at that second phase was the buildings themselves. Um, and that we started design in 1993. So five years uh, overall, including design time. A cost, uh, I can't tell you that. There are lots of rumors about what the cost was. Um, one newspaper headline reported 100 million pounds, but I can tell you it was nowhere near that amount. Um, the neighbors, they were all invited. I think most of them came to the open house before the temple was dedicated. And uh, we still have good relationships with those neighbors. In fact, where neighbors have moved out, uh, a number of church members have moved in. Uh, to be to be close to the the temple and with the seven buildings yes we do worship there the temple is reserved for special ceremonies uh, marriages and instruction and so forth um, our day-to-day -day worship takes place in the chapel and there's one right in the center of the site and of course the other buildings are associated with either those working or visiting the temple or missionaries who received initial training before they serve in parts of Europe. I hope that answers the questions. Yes, thank you, Peter. So our next question is uh, for Sue. Um, Peter Judd was asking if you could please just do a brief summary of the history of Dunfield House before it was acquired by the church. 
and you need to unmute yourself, Sue. <laughs> There we go. Very briefly, um, we know there's been a structure on the site um, since the 13th century. Um, Dunfield in its current, um, uh, how, how it looks, um, was um, completed in the 1850s. Um, we know that the spirit of kindness and compassion was there at that time because the owner um, saw a, a family walking along the road and sent his servant down with lamb and potatoes and food for them for their journey. So um, that's a lovely story um, that shows that God is working in these buildings before um, we're even there. Um, it was owned by a succession of people, it was going to be turned into a hotel called the Mountain View Hotel um, until Community of Christ, um, I think had looked at about 60 buildings before they arrived at Dunfield and decided that Dunfield was um, the place to, to buy. So it's been very much a family home. Um, there's um, very owned by a lot of um, religious leaders, um, but not actually a church on the site itself. Thank you. Um, next up, Justice Manning um, wanted to say two interesting presentations from two different perspectives. Um, and he also had a question, which I was wondering whether um, the plan for building LDS temples, if they have a basic common criteria for temple design um, or not. So that one's over to you, Peter. Okay, uh, common criteria. Um, the contents of them are the common criteria rather than the size or the design. Um, You'll see temples with one spire, uh, several spires, some with an angel Moroni on one of the spires and some with no angel, some with stained glass, some with none, some multi-story, some single story. But it's about the rooms and it's the sacred spaces inside. And basically uh, they're the same type of rooms. We'll have rooms for instruction, telling us about the, the uh, Adam and Eve and and uh, the, the covenants that they made and and inviting us to make promises to try to be uh, good Christians and follow the Lord. And then there's rooms where marriages take place, where couples kneeling at an altar are sealed together with priesthood authority for time and all eternity. And there's a baptismal font, usually in a, in a basement. Other than that, uh, the temples are clad in stone or marble or sometimes brick, but the general criteria is the external material where possible, where the context permits, is to be white or off-white. And where, where possible, the church will try to find a high ground for the temple. So um, it, it's up on a hill, so it can be seen. Thank you. Next, we have a comment from Michael Clark. He said, I've been to both the Preston Temple and Dunfield House and both are beautiful places. So thank you for um, that comment, Michael. Thank you, um, Michael. <laughs> Next, we have a question. Um, I guess Sue can field this one because it's about Community of Christ. So if you don't know, you can pass it off to Andrew or somebody. Um, how many members does Community of Christ Church have worldwide and in the UK? Like I said, if you're not sure, you can Pass off to someone who knows because I don't. <laughs> I, I might pass over to Andrew on this one. I, I know um, the, the numbers were, um, I think, about 250,000, was it, Andrew, at one stage? Yeah. Um, so that's worldwide, um, about 250,000. Um, and I think in the UK, I'm not quite sure of the, the actual number of people in the UK who are members. All right. Um, next up, we've got uh, another question for Peter um, with a little bit of a comment from Andrew. Um, I'm not sure which Andrew, there are several. Um, the, he says, the stake I grew up in was in the Preston Temple District. Since its opening, it has attracted hundreds of members resulting in accelerated growth of units around the temple and even a rumored house price boom. Um, can you comment on whether this is a desired consequence of temple building? Um, 
yes, I think it is a desired consequence, but it's um, uh, it's it's not uncommon um, for where a temple is announced and built. Uh, many people from the church will want to live close by because uh, they love visiting and worshiping and, and meeting around the temple because it is a sacred space. Um, and they feel that families can be stronger by associating themselves in sacred spaces. Uh, whether it's led to housing price rises, uh, some report around the world that, yes, it's led to an increase um, in prices. Um, but in terms of congregations, when the temple was announced, there was a, a congregation in Ch Chorley and a congregation in Preston. And where there were two congregations, there are now six. So it's it, it has been significant growth, and that's just in the probably 10 mile radius of the temple. All right. Um, now back to Sue. Um, Mark was wondering, have any groups from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ever stayed at Dunfield? Not, not to my knowledge, no. Um, I, um, it, it is something that we've reached out, um, but we've not actually had any that I know of. Um, we have a lot of um, people who visit um, as individuals um, just to have a look around and um, sometimes wondering if it's, if it's an LDS building, um, but sometimes just looking at um, just looking at the two faiths and um, exploring, you know, how, how their faith was developing. So we've had people who visited as individuals, but we've not had um, an LDS group stay at Dunfield, um, but they're very welcome. <laughs> All right, back for Peter. Um, Glynis wrote, um, I remember reading an article about the Preston Temple, which said it was bigger below ground than it is above. Is this right? That's a very good question. Um, in total area, no, but the, the lower ground does extend beyond the perimeter of the upper ground. So yes, if that's understandable, um, there is a basement and the basement houses the baptistry. And uh, when we get baptized, we wear white. So there's changing rooms and toilets and the usual things, but there's also all the mechanical plant rooms and engineering rooms that are associated, which make quite an expansive basement. Above it, the floor levels are smaller in perimeter, but there's two stories above. So overall, um, area-wise, it's bigger above, but footprint-wise, it's bigger below. Hope that's clear. Mm -hmm. All right, and we have another question for you, Peter. Um, Todd Davison asked, is there a tradition for LDS folks to make pilgrimages to many of the various temples around the world? Can a member decide which temple they go to for their wedding, for instance, or would they automatically be expected to go to the closest one? Good question. Um, any member of the church can enter any temple anywhere in the world. So you can book your wedding, um, your visit uh, to any temple. Um, but uh, most people choose to go to their local temple because of obvious convenience reasons. But if somebody wanted to go to San Diego or um, Oakland, San Francisco, then that's fine and they'd be made welcome. Um, I think it's the, um, maybe I'll just take a sentence on, the, uh, on this. The sacred spaces, uh, it, it's not so much the edifice, the building, um, as you referred to earlier, Sue, you know, it might be a humble building. Um, you know, some of the temples are bigger and grander than maybe some of the others. It, it's what goes on inside. And uh, there was a story that uh, the temple president from Sao Paulo, Brazil, told me that a family had traveled, saved up, and they traveled three days by bus to get there. Unfortunately, they didn't realize where the stop was and they, they went past 
the temple and ended up at the bus terminus. It was a walk of 17 miles back. They had no more money and they walked as a family back 17 miles and only the father had footwear. And when they arrived at the temple, they were just delighted. No complaints. They just enjoy the sacred space and those wonderful things. And that was an opportunity for them to be married together for a time and all eternity. And they rejoiced at attending that sacred space. And the temple staff were so kind, they gave them all new shoes and helped them on their journey home. Now I'm back to Sue again. Um, so Margaret, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for your presentation. And then she was wondering, what are the characters on the stand outside of Dunfield House from one of the pictures there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Margaret, you're talking about where our peace garden was. Um, and there was um, some, I think it was Arabic um, writing on there. Um, and in the, garden, in the peace garden, we have Peace Poles, which is um, a worldwide um, organization um, where we um, where people put up peace poles which saying may peace prevail on earth um, and at Dunfield we've got poles facing north south east and west um, and one of our um, one of our dreams when we were working at Dunfield was to have peace poles which actually had the language of everybody who visited Dunfield um, we didn't quite make that um, but it's actually embracing the whole of the world within um, the, the peace garden that we've got. So I hope I hope that answers the question. I'm hoping that was what the question related to. All right. Um, another question from Carol um, for Peter. Does Peter, do you know where the next temple will be built in the United Kingdom? I think if I could do, did, I could make lots of money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I have no knowledge of the announcements of the temple. Um, the president of the church, I think he's announced about 40 temples in the last four years. But, but where the next one was, the Scottish are hoping and praying for one. The Welsh would like their own too. Um, so who knows? Sorry. <laughs> All right. I think we have time for... Um, one more question, if anyone has one more question, if not, there's a couple more comments in the chat um, that I'd like to share. Someone's typing one last question real fast. Um, Rod Packwood would like to say he was born and raised in Herefordshire, and if I'm mispronouncing it, I'm very sorry, everybody. Um, never knew of this lovely place. However, we did visit the Sacred Grove. And we had another comment from Michael, um, he was the one who said that he's visited both Preston Temple um, and Dunfield House, and he said it'd be good if people from each church could visit Dunfield House and Preston Temple, see so what he did and visited both, which would be lovely. <laughs> um, do we have that one last question? Anyone just dying to ask tonight or burning inside to know? If not, I will pass it back to Andrew. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much, Sue. The two remarkable presentations um, and the very illuminating discussion as well. So thank you. Um, this was our fifth webinar of the British Isles Latter-day Saint History Association. We welcome any feedback that you want to give and you've had emails from me. Um, so, um, if you'd like to email me with comments for improvements, we would like to take those on board. Um, we have a great lineup of webinars coming. Um, and also in May, subject to COVID-19 restrictions, we're planning an in-person tour pilgrimage of Preston. And as Peter said, the oldest continuous uh, congregation in Latter-day Saintism. Preston is also very uh, important in my life because I was born in St. Joseph's Hospital there. Um, so it's a uh, double significance for me. And then we'll go up the Rebel Valley uh, to Walker Fold, where there's a romantic story. We'll go to Clitheroe and to Chapman 
and to Downer, uh, which are also important stories in that first missionary journey uh, or time, uh, 1837, 1838. Um, so I'll be sending out, out a flyer of, about how to book uh, for that in-person coach tour. And we park at the Chorley Temple and get on the coach there and come back there. <clears throat> so if you've not seen the Chorley Temple, I mean, the Preston Temple in Chorley, uh, that's your opportunity to see it, or an opportunity. In a month's time, on Friday, the 25th of February, we have Stephen Blue, Professor Stephen Blue, uh, an art professor, who will talk about the art and story of Sutcliffe Morsley. Now, Sutcliffe Morsley speaks like Peter, or did do, uh, was uh, an artist who designed designs for Calico, uh, emigrated in 1842 with his children and wife to Nauvoo, and in Nauvoo was an artist there and did paintings of uh, Emma and Joseph and other leaders of, at that time. So that'll be a fabulous story. It's Lancashire, it's Nauvoo, um, uh, it's uh, a story that belongs to all of us. Um, in April, we'll have stories of British LDS and Community of Christ churches in the 20th century. And that will be led by uh, James Perry, who will tell LDS stories, and our very own Peter Judd from Enfield, uh, London, who's on this call. And Peter will be talking about Enfield. So we'll send a full schedule out um, as this is finalized to you all. Um, we hope that you'll be able to join us in more. We have recorded this session and we'll send out a link to that recording in due course. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Sue and Peter. <laughs>